Ladies and gentlemen, the American Horse Council is an organization that has done great benefit for horse owners and horse lovers all across the United States and Canada. We have to state that their efforts and, well, you know what kind of a political world that we live in. Without the American Horse Council, a lot of things would go by the wayside and we would be in very difficult times indeed. It is my pleasure to welcome the president of the American Horse Council, Julie Broadway, and we'll ask Julie to come forward and tell us what's going on with the American Horse Council. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm going to begin by telling you you're getting a two-for-one price this morning because I brought with me Ashley first. She's the American Horse Council's Director of Communication, and she also oversees our Unwanted Horse Coalition. So I'm going to give you a few remarks, and then Ashley's going to come up and share some other details with you. So for those of you that are not familiar with the American Horse Council, let me find my flipper here. I want to begin by acquainting you with our mission, who we are, and what we do in D.C. And last year, the American Horse Council Board of Trustees undertook a strategic planning exercise. And one of the things we found was that our mission statement was a mouthful. And so like a lot of organizations, we decided we needed to make this more concise and easier for people to understand. So our mission statement is to advocate for the social, economic, and legislative interests of the United States equine industry. The council is composed of over 700 members individual members and over 150 organizational members. As you can see here, that ranges from interest as polo, trail riding, jumping, showing, rodeo, all the way to racing. What that means is this diverse group has a broad range of challenges and issues. We like to tell folks, including our organizational members, we have a reach of about 900,000 horse enthusiasts across the U.S. There we go. Uh, we are governed by a 16-member board of directors. They include representatives from the American Association of Equine Practitioners, the United States Equestrian Federation, the American Quarter Horse Association, the National Thoroughbred Racing Association, the Jockey Club, and the United States Trotting Association. Beginning in 2018, we have a new initiative. We are adding two at-large positions. One of those at-large positions will be filled by the chair of the Coalition of State Horse Councils. The other position is up for nominations. We will accept applicants beginning in January, and we hope that someone will consider putting their name in for that opportunity. It's a two-year term, and I'm happy to speak with you if you're interested in learning more about that. One of the things I like to tell everybody is that there's a perception that the American Horse Council is a large organization based in Washington, D.C., when in fact we're a relatively small organization, but we're a great organization of people who are horse people who are working for the horse industry. We have Cliff Williamson, who's our Director of Health and Regulatory Affairs. Christy Schulte is the Program Manager for Time to Ride. Ashley, as I mentioned, is our Director of Communications and the Unwanted Horse Coalition. And Brian Brindle is a new addition to our staff. He's the Director of Policy and Legislative Affairs. And we have a wonderful office manager, Ryan Smith, and myself. And as you can see, other than Ryan, who we're exposing to horses right now, all of us have a background in horses. And we really enjoy the work we do. We're very enthusiastic, and we love to represent the industry in DC. One of the things that I like to tell people is the, the purpose of the council is so important to the long-term success of the industry because what happens in Washington really affects you, your sport, and the horses that you love. And because we need to influence what happens in D.C. to prevent adverse effects. And lastly, because we need to influence change in a positive way to open avenues and opportunities for the industry. We can boil down our focus areas into these six keys legislative and regulatory advocacy, industry and regulatory liaisons, economy and taxes, industry sustainability and growth, industry visibility, and education and leadership development. So I'm going to hit on a couple of things under each one of these bullets. 
So what we do is work at every level in Washington to ensure policymakers in Congress, the administration, and federal agencies are aware of the needs of the industry and how legislation and regulations will impact the industry. What are some of those things? Well, of course, tax reform. I'm going to show you a slide about that. You've all been hearing about it. We know it's coming. We don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that. One of the things near and dear to my heart is immigration. I hear all the time when I travel around the industry how important foreign workers are to the success of our industry, so that's a real key for us right now. We're going to talk a little bit about disease detection, management and monitoring, and the Equine Disease Communication Center, the National Welfare Code of Practice, and the National Equine Health Plan. All are very important things to keep our industry thriving. I'm also going to mention drugs and medication because that's a key topic. And then, of course, aftercare, which is our unwanted horse coalition. So let's begin by taking a look first at legislative in the form of tax reform. Well, as you know, November 2nd, the House unveiled what it was going to propose to do for tax reform. They took about a week and came back and had a markup of that legislation. And they will be voting, according to CBS this morning. How many watch news this morning? Anybody? I was up early watching the news. According to CBS, they're going to vote today on the House side. So we'll see if that comes to pass. They've been telling us before Thanksgiving, so hopefully we'll see if that, that makes it. A couple of highlights from that are the corporate tax rate. As you know, the current rate is 35%, and they're proposing 20%. The estate tax, the bill on the House side would repeal the estate tax after six years and double the current exemption on estates valued at $5.49 million. Um, so we'll see if that happens or not, because that's the opposite of what the Senate is proposing to do. Uh, charitable giving continues deductions for charitable contributions, which I think is very important to the equine industry. Many of the associations have foundations, and a lot of people make contributions to those, so we're very happy to see that continue on. And then mortgage interest is also included in this. About the same time that the House on November 9th was saying, this is what our plan is, the Senate was saying, okay, here's what our plan is. It offers a couple of key differences that are there. This includes delaying the corporate tax rate reduction to 2019, keeping the estate tax in place while doubling the threshold value that triggers the tax. So they're starting on the markup this week. Again, they tell us, hopefully before Thanksgiving. So we'll see how things come together. On immigration, especially with H-2B visas, we have three areas that we're really focusing on. The first one is through appropriations, where we're trying to convince them to include a provision in the final spending bill that will uh, include cap relief for H-2B visas. As most of you know, they set a cap, and we reached the cap, Ashley, help me, I think we reached the cap in January this year. All of those visas were gone, so everybody's been scrambling for that. The second is we're working on what's called the Season Act, this is a bill that would provide cap relief by establishing an exemption that would allow well-vetted workers who have already held a visa to come back. And we've got a lot of co-sponsors that, so we're really hoping to gain some momentum on that. The last one is called Save Our Small and Seasonal Business Act. This legislation will expedite applications to meet demands during peak seasons. And we've got a lot of bipartisan support for that. And if you know some folks, We'll be happy to talk to you and help us campaign for that. We send out action alerts frequently about things that are going on up on the Hill and invite you to contact your congressional members to help us push these over the edge and make them happen. Um, this is one, again, as I said, that's really, I think, close to the industry because we really need to find a way to break what's going on with the cap. One of the things I thought you would find especially interesting is where we are on the PAST Act. That stands for Prevent All Soaring Tactics. Uh, as you know, uh, we have put forward the PAST Act uh, in previous years, and it has not come to fruition. In the spring of this year, Representative Yoho from Florida and Kurt Schrader from Oregon uh, reintroduced the Prevent All Soaring Tactics Act for us. We're very pleased it has 268 co-sponsors in the House, but we know have no Senate companion. So we've been working really hard to try to find some ways to uh, identify someone to move that forward. Right now we're in discussions with Senator Crapo from Idaho about a possible way to move that ahead. And if you have a relationship with him, I'd love to speak with you and see if you can help us make that happen. So let me talk about the Horse Protection Act, because we've had a lot of confusion about that over the last couple of years. The Prevent All Soaring Tactics Act was a legislative way to address the issue of soaring. 
the United States Department of Agriculture decided it wanted to seek a regulatory way to address soaring. And so they took out the Horse Protection Act and they offered some amendments to that to try to address some concerns they had about soaring in the industry. Uh, they had a 90-day comment period, and any of you that went to a session, we truly appreciate all your hard work. We provided a lot of comments uh, related to that, and we were delighted that they incorporated everything we said in the final version of that. Unfortunately, when the election came along, the incoming administration put a hold on all changes. So it wasn't just the Horse Protection Act, they just froze everything which means that the proposal is still out there in the form that we would like to see it move forward in. We just don't know what the way forward is. We've met with the United States Department of Agriculture. They are still hopeful that they're gonna see it happen. We just think it's gonna take a while because the administration is really busy with a lot of other things. So keep, keep you posted on that, and if you have questions, by all means, see me. I thought I would mention a couple of other legislative things, but I don't have slides on these. So again, I'm happy to talk to you about them. We're working on double-decker trailer prohibition. We're working on trails access. And we're working on a new one that came up just this last week, electronic logging devices exemption for livestock. So that's a couple of new things that we've really gotten into. On the regulatory side, the National Equine Health Plan works to protect the health and welfare of the population of horses, facilitate movement, ensure available regulatory services, and promote the economic continuity of that business. An essential part of the National Equine Health Plan is the Equine Disease Communication Center. This is an industry-wide program to help improve horse health, decrease the risk of disease spread, and prevent economic losses from infectious diseases. As some of you know, we've had some shows over the last couple years that have been affected by a disease, and it's really caused those shows to suffer some economic losses. We're very happy that the Equine Disease Communication Center is fully operational, and you can access it at the website that is shown. And I just threw up here uh, for your uh, information, since January of 2017, we've had 279 total outbreaks or cases that have reported. That seems like a lot to me. <laughs> and there's a breakdown of what those different types of cases are. So in the area of sustainability and growth, the program that we currently have um, underway is Time to Ride. We're very pleased that the Arabian Horse Association has been a partner with us in this program. It seeks to grow the industry and the love of equestrian sports, and we are now in about our third or fourth year of the program, and we've this slide has 90,000, but I just got the latest statistics, and we crossed 100,000 uh, enthusiasts that have gone through the program so far. One of the things that we are doing new this year is we've divided the program into two parts. So host barns agree to put on an event. They capture information for people who come and have an experience with the horse. It can be just as they've talked earlier today, as simple as petting a horse or just having an experience with a horse. And those are in that 100,000. But the question that we kept asking ourselves is, what's the return on investment? In other words, we're pumping a lot of money into time to ride. What are we getting for that? Are we creating the pipeline of long-term horse enthusiasts that we'd like to see? So this year we divided the program into two parts. So hosts are not only tracking people that come for a first-time experience, they're tracking people that are coming back for a repeat experience so we can get a sense of how that's going. So I have some more data for you about that probably right after the first of the year. So with that, I'm going to ask Ashley to come up and give you a little bit of an update on the Unwanted Horse Coalition. This is our effort to really ensure sustainability in the industry. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm just going to give you a brief background about the Unwanted Horse Coalition and some initiatives that we're working on. Um, as you can see, our mission is to reduce the number of unwanted horses and to improve their welfare through education and industry collaboration. So how do we do that exactly? Uh, we primarily aim to educate the industry and the general public itself about what owning responsibly entails, what comes along with owning a horse. Um, we also aim to reduce the number of want unwanted horses and help these horses in transition by working with programs such as a Home for Every Horse and the Right Horse Initiative. And we also um, 
have our successful Operation Gelding program, which, which helps provide uh, funding for castrations for people who rescue stallions. Uh, we are 100% funded through memberships and donations, and the Arabian Horse Association has been a supporter of the UHC for quite some time now, so thank you very much for that. These are just some examples of the resources and materials that we provide. Everything is free and available on the UHC's website. Um, we have our Join the Effort booklet, which details programs and activities organizations can do to help reduce the number of unwanted horses. We also have our Geld and Spay brochure that details the benefits of gelding, spaying, and hormone therapy for mares, as these practices certainly pertain to uh, equine health and owning responsibly. We recently released a series of handouts that we encourage rescue organizations and even breed registries such as yourself to customize and utilize for prospective adopters and even current horse owners. Um, topics include, is horse ownership right for me? What are the costs of horse ownership? Basic horse care uh, nutrition and questions to ask when rehoming a horse. Again, as I mentioned, all these are, are available for free on the UHC website. And just yesterday, we, offic we officially published, published that estate planning guide, a guide for horse owners. Um, if you're interested in obtaining a copy, please let me know. I have hard copies that are available at the office, and there's a PDF on the website as well. Um, I'm also working to create a curriculum of sorts on owning responsibly for schools with equine programs. Um, I mentioned Operation Gelding. This is kind of our cornerstone program, you could say. We obviously feel the best way to reduce the number of unwanted horses is to avoid unwanted breeding. So this can clearly be done best and easiest by gelding. Um, Operation Gelding provides guidance, materials, and financial support to groups that wish to host low or no cost gelding clinics. We want to encourage horse owners to castrate their stallions, um, but also assist those who may not have the financial means to do so. The program started back in August of 2010, and stri we strictly held gelding clinics, um, but it was becoming clearer to us that the individual horse owner may have trouble finding transportation for that horse to any local clinics that were happening. So in January 2017, we introduced a voucher program where an owner or a 501c3 organization can apply for a voucher to help um, aid in the castration of the horse. So we've completely eliminated the barrier to getting the horse to the clinic and for travel. Um, so far this year, the voucher program has gelded close to 250 stallions. Um, just overall as a whole, we've since August 2010, we've gelded 2,041 stallions through both clinics and the voucher program. Um, but by the end of this year, I anticipate having gelded close to 2,100. Moving forward, I'm working with animal control officers to get the voucher program into law enforcement's hands to help them deal with, st with stallions in seizure or neglect cases. Um, additionally, we're exploring the option of including a free microchip uh, and chip registration for any horses that participate in a gelding clinic. We're still ironing, ironing out the details for that, but if anyone has any questions, please do let me know. Since the program has been around for quite some time now, I've been getting the question more recently, is, is this program working? Is it really helping to reduce the number of unwanted horses? So I set out to survey just the rescues that have um, participated in clinics, just the clinics, not the voucher program so far. As you can see, these, this is just a summary of the results. 94% of the rescues surveyed said the gelding helped improve the stallion's behavior. 80% said gelding made the horse easier to train. Um, only 60% said the horse was successfully adopted out, but there's some caveats to that. Um, some of the horses were not able to be adopted out so that it was just going to be a sanctuary situation, or some of them were still in training and not ready yet to be, um, go out in the world and, be, and have a second career. Um, but overall, 94% felt that, this, that gelding the stallion helped with his adoption. So we're still working on collecting some more data to um, find out, again, if this program is working and where we have um, a meeting coming up at the end of November with the Right Horse Initiative to kind of get a better handle on this, the state of the unwanted horse problem in the U.S. right now.
So one of the things we're most excited about this year is a new economic impact study. Uh, it's been 10 years since we did the last study, which captures not only the economic effects of all segments of the horse industry, it also provides invaluable demographic data and insights into professions and related industries that are impacted by equine ownership. It really enables us and the entire industry to educate the public, the media, and elected officials in Congress and state legislatures regarding the industry's economic size, impact, and importance. Uh, the national study cost us $400,000 to do, and we appreciate all the organizations that have contributed to make that happen. And we are doing individual state breakouts and some specialty reports, and we have some states that have commissioned those to happen. I think four. 14, sta 14 states that got specialty breakouts. Uh, we're really excited about this because the study itself has been expanded greatly from when we did it last time. <coughs> this time it includes all age groups. And what we mean by that is the previous study only asked the survey respondents to indicate if they were over 18 years of age. One of the things we wanted to understand was what kind of youth we had in the pipeline that were involved with the industry. So it's encompassing all age brackets. It's much more comprehensive, and we have a whole lot of greater flexibility with the data. Not only are we going down to the state level, but we're going down to the zip code and the district level. So we'll have a lot more work, uh, things we can work with. Um, I thought I would just highlight for you, we are surveying horse owners, we are doing racetracks and OTBs, we are doing competitions and shows, sanctuaries and rescues is a new category this time, therapeutic riding is a new category, we also added academia and youth as I mentioned. Uh, we distributed these uh, surveys through all of our partners at the state horse councils and equine associations, all kind of uh, equine media outlets. Um, the consultant that we're using is targeting the 1st of December to have the draft of the national report ready. Uh, and we hope to have the state and the specialty commission reports uh, ready sometime, I think, in February or March. Um, I'm going to look over at Glenn, if I can see him over there. Um, the United uh, Professional Horsemen's Association did commission a specialty report. It included the trotting breeds. So there will be specific numbers provided in that report that uh, relate uh, to the Arabian Horse Association. So you'll hear more about that. Um, we're really excited about this report. We think it's going to uh, help move the dial a lot. Uh, a lot of people rely on those numbers, but they've gotten a little old and stale. So having some great numbers uh, to work with as we go forward will be a, a really good thing. One of the growing segments of the industry right now is equine assisted therapy. So that's one of the reasons for the breakouts. So things are, things are moving along really well there. I'm going to wrap up by talking about just two quick things here. Uh, we take very seriously our role in providing education and marketing to the industry. This ranges from news, legislative updates, information sessions, educational content through webinars, partnering with the American Youth Horse Council, and our annual conference. Uh, we offer a, quarter, a quarterly webinar on industry topics. It's open to anyone. And we do provide those as podcasts on our website. So if you're not available on the day we do the webinar, go to our website and hear about it. We did one uh, on Monday. My days are mixed up. Yeah, Monday after this past Monday. And it was on tax reform. And the topic was called, Is It Greener? Is the grass greener on the other side of tax reform? We had three really great speakers, so we all go out there and listen to that. Uh, the, the third quarter webinar was on immigration, and we had some great speakers on that, so some, some good data out there. Uh, the next one will be February the 12th, 2018. They're done on a Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And I would also just encourage you to consider joining us in Washington, D.C. in June of 2018 for our annual conference. Uh, our committees meet on uh, Sunday and Monday, and we have our national issues forum on Tuesday, and we've got some great things lined up there. I thought I would just close uh, with this slide. Uh, looking ahead, we have, as I said, a new strategic plan. We picked four pillars for the plan. They are advocacy marketing and communications, health and welfare, and governance, and we have a number of initiatives under each of those. So look to hear more about all of that um, over the coming months. Um, I will say that there were some things that came out of um, the last plan that we are really focusing on, and that includes import-export protocols, cross-species livestock concerns, rural development issues. I was at the White House last week meeting with Secretary of Agriculture Purdue to talk about rural infrastructure. And uh, surprisingly, uh, the American Horse Council has 
predominantly focused in the past on what I would call domesticated equines. We've not gotten into the wild horse and burrow issue, but we are doing a research project on that right now and trying to determine if the American Horse Council is going to uh, have a position on that or not. So look for some more information about that. Uh, what I thought I would close with is telling you that the horse industry is very lucky and usually has bipartisan support for many of the issues that impact us in Congress. Uh, many members of Congress have a connection to the industry through a personal experience uh, growing up with a horse or because the industry is really important to their state or their district. So for this reason, regardless of what party holds the reins in Washington, the horse industry usually has allies that we can turn to. Uh, but just like within the industry itself, there are often different opinions in Congress about what's good for the industry. Regardless of that, we really need you. Uh, we do what we can in Washington, but it's important that they hear from their constituents. So we believe that you should contact your elected officials and help us to begin to educate them about issues that are important to horse owners and the horse industries in the states and the districts. So with that, I thank you for your time. I thank you for your support. And we are delighted to be your voice in Washington, D.C.